Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this seventh installment of 12 uh, of our 12 part series webinar on geology and the mining sector. Today, we are uh, diving in our third block, which covers mining exploitation. And specifically today, we are going to explore drilling the main steps of the mining cycle. Um, as usual, if you have any questions uh, during the duration of this webinar, feel free to type them in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, if you have any questions while uh, during a replay of this webinar series, feel free to send us an email at info at iddpnql.ca. We'll make sure that information gets to Francine and we'll get that answer back to you as soon as possible. Without further ado, Francine, the floor is yours. Thank you. So welcome. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Won't be long. You see anything? Yes. We're fine. We're fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go. So welcome to this new block, mining exploration, exploitation. So the first lesson, drilling main steps in the mining cycle. So the block, the mining exploitation block uh, has the drilling, the mineral resource and how to build the mine, the basic steps. Today's lesson. Uh, separated into four, the drilling notions, concepts and models, main steps of mining cycle, and the drilling campaign activities. So the drilling applications uh, in the non-petroleum domains, because the petroleum domain is one set apart, uh, the non-petroleum domains are basically for the mining industry, so us, uh, usually the drilling helps avoid the uh, geological problems like uh, the presence of faults, brittle rocks, salt domes, etc. Uh, the drilling within the construction industry helps to extend construction wires or pipelines within unreachable grounds such as river beds to offer continuity in construction. And um, also uh, mainly used within the uh, geothermal industry where we have a high geothermal gradient known in some rocks like granite that can be channeled uh, to provide energy. So this is a great place to present this uh, figure which represents the mining life cycle. Where what we've done so far, we've seen within the first uh, six lessons are basically uh, within the prospecting and the early stages of exploration. Today, we're going to move on to the uh, mid to later stages of exploration just before we develop a mine. So these uh, stages are presented here. When we first arrive in an area that has no study or no data, it is still a concept. We then explore within the study area for a while, we have the early exploration, the middle exploration to late stage exploration. If we are lucky, we have some discoveries and we work on these discoveries as much as we can to produce some economics and develop it into a mine. So this takes a lot of time and the value within each step varies, but the risk also varies a lot within these steps. So mainly between the concept and the mine, we basically have uh, roughly about 10 years extent. And the first steps till the middle is pretty risky. Uh, and then down towards the um, development and we have the full value when it becomes a mine. So the drilling campaign is the most crucial phase of mineral exploration stages. Basically, we can resume it as the process whereby rigs or hand operated tools are used to make holes in order to intercept an ore body. 
the ultimate stage in exploration is to make money, find a deposit with the mineral we want to find and make money out of it. Uh, so this is the Quebec's uh, ministry, resource ministry um, definition of these stages. So we have the mineral resource, exploration, deposit appraisal, and the development. So today we'll be seeing these steps. We're basic, basically being around here, the exploration drilling, how we go from an early exploration to target generation and exploration drilling. Next lessons to come in the next weeks, we'll move on within the life cycle of projects. So today we're basically step four, the sub step four and five of an advanced exploration project. So in mineral exploration, drilling campaigns are done for their main objectives are to define ore body at a depth and its geometry, to access to the host trucks and colleges, to estimate the tonnage and grade of a deposit, to determine ore body's absence or presence, which is both as important as we'll see later on, to characterize ore body's mineral deposit types. We'll see them next uh, in the next lesson in two weeks within our mineral resource lesson. I basically listed a few here, like uh, veins or stockwork systems, the volcanic massive sulfides, the, known as the VMS, and we have other main types like uh, porphyry copper and other types we'll see in two weeks. So mainly, when geologists define drill targeted holes, they are testing a mental model of the size, shape, and attitude that a theoretically interpreted ore body. That's the important part to understand here. The more accurate that model, the greater the chance that the hole will be successful. So to become more accurate is to add more data, hence to add more drill hole to help us define the shape, extension uh, of an ore body. Example here, we have a theoretical, typical shape of a VMS deposit with the alteration halo from distal to proximal uh, zones within a VMS. So the more we're gonna implant drill holes, the more we'll know if we are near or far or in a non-existent deposit. So, and it will also help us to refine our theoretical model that we have in our head and to make sure to validate it to make sure it is the right model and the right geological environment we are working in. Each geological mineralized environment has their own characteristics and so it helps us to plan these drill holes. So the model is the result of an extensive detailed preparatory studies on prospect involving everything we can find from the literature, both the geological literature that we have, anything that has to do with theoretical literature that helps us understand an, ex an, uh, an example of uh, our uh, interpreted model, but it could also be all the historical literature from any work that has been done in the area on the field or also from previous, uh, previous sorry, um, drill holes. So it is also the examination of known outcropping mineralization. So we can either take the old maps, take the information from them, or choose to go back on the field and add our own observations. Uh, all these interpretations come also from all the geological mapping and the reg from regional and from both regional and detailed scales, and also from all the geophysical and geochemical survey studies. So it's a blend in of all the types of observation that was taken on the field and from historical works. Adding drill holes within any exploration targets will refine the model by increasing the local geological knowledge. As the figure here shows, the more we're gonna add some drill holes, 
the more we're going to be able to refine the shape of the deposit here shown into uh, the red and the black here inside. So if we implant one drill hole, there is no way we're going to be able to find or to define all the details of all the complex geochemist, geo, uh, all the complex of the geomet geometry of the deposit. As we're going to add some drill holes, we're going to be able to refine the limits here between the deposit and the host rocks. Every drill hole into a prospect whether it makes an intersection of mineralization or not, and perhaps especially if it does not, will increase the geological knowledge and lead to modification or confirmation of a model. As this little uh, simple uh, design schema is showing, is we have in green, we have our pegmatite, which will be our deposit, our lithium, in this case, lithium deposit and the drill holes that was done around the deposit. We can see that there are one, there are four drill holes that can, that show lithium concentrations and intersections and that define exactly the limit of our deposit. But the drill hole here is also very important because it shows the limit of our deposit. Because this drill hole is here and does not cross any of the deposit, we know that our deposit is what we call closed on this side. Closed meaning we are into our host rock. If we look on the other side, we can see that everywhere that there was a drill hole, we were able to extend our deposit. It would be wise to try to insert some more drill holes to try to find the limit on this side. As long as we don't have any drill holes, we say the deposit is open. Open for two reasons. Open because there is no data. So for now, all we can do is extend the knowledge from one to the other until we ha have another drill hole we cannot say that the deposit is limited to here. We assume or speculate that it can be expanded on this side. So it is open also to add a drill hole on this side. So there are two phases, two steps of a drilling campaign, two phases or two steps. There would be an initial exploration drilling. The initial one would be we arrive into a sector, an area where there is no um, historical work or no uh, advanced knowledge of the area. So we do some regional targeting generation using anything we can find from regional geological maps, from uh, geophysical maps, geochemical maps, and we superpose any anomalies with big structures for gold would be with big structures and try to define these anomalies for drilling exploration targets. We have the definition drilling. Defin definition drilling is for moving on from exploration stage projects to mine stage projects. So only if there is a high, no risk probability for the proven occurrence of a deposit. So we're stepping out. The stepping out, if I come back here, would be if we have our known deposit, we space out from the deposit to find the limit of the deposit as shown here. So that would be a stepping out. If we do an infill, as that means our deposit is already well defined and is close to being mined, and we need to fine tune exactly its shape, exactly its geometry, exactly its dip, so that we don't make any mistake while mining and producing the deposit. So we're infilling, adding more drill holes with minimum spacing. Finally, this infilling will also help to do a resource model estimate within the deposit prior to the opening of the mine. The techniques, the major techniques, we have the percussion drilling. 
This type of drilling is whereby a hammer beats the surface of the rock and breaks into chips, breaks it into chips. So it's used by what we call the reverse circulation drilling or the RC drilling. And as shown here, it's basically used within the uh, subsurface from 100 to 200 max meters and used into softer rocks or soils. And it is an easy way to have some information and a cheaper way also to have some information. The rotary drilling, as shown here, it is a metal met method used to make a rock drill using the shock slings produced by a mass that strikes a rotating drill or to a rotating rod column, having a drill at the opposite end. So the rotation of the drill is produced by one or more turning devices, uh, as the rifle, the bar, the integral model, or by an external drive. So the rotary drilling, what comes out of a rotary drilling is known as core, as seen here. So the rock is known as core here. So this is the type of drilling where samples are recovered by rotation of the drill rod without percussion of a hammer. So that includes the diamond drilling, the rotary air blast, or the OJ drilling. So basically the ones we'll see uh, and use uh, here are the reverse circulation and the diamond drilling. Diamond drilling is the one that will go to higher depths. The reverse circulation RC drilling, the advantages are that they are relatively cheap, cheap sorry, they are quicker large, they produce large samples, and they uh, produce uncontaminated areas. The disadvantages is that they have a limited access within their depths of drilling. We cannot extract any structural data from our core, and the samples can be contaminated below the water table. The diamond drilling Advantages are that they have a maximum geological information. They bring us maximum geological information. They produce uncontaminated uh, samples and they have a high quality of sampling. The disadvantages are that they are more expensive. The process is slower. They produce small sample size and uh, it is more extensive uh, to prepare their site preparation and water supply is required for that process. The diamond drilling surfaces, uh, surface drills are the most used. The drill hammer works on the surface on the ground and the column of the string bars is installed between it and the drill bit. The impact energy transmitted by the hammer to the extension of the rods must be used to the maximum in such a way that the force of advance is constant. As shown here, the drilling equipment must be firmly positioned and fixed to the floor. In the worldwide review, RC drilling versus core drilling or diamond drill hole drilling, we can see which countries uses each, uh, which method. And us in Canada, we use mainly the core diamond drilling method. That's basically because of our geological rock units and the type of mineralization we have versus the Australia where they have other types of mineralization and geology. So if we start within a mineral exploration, when do, when do we do an exploration drilling campaign? Normally we do the drilling step uh, as the final step in the mineral exploration. The final step to check is used to check and validate any potential source of previous or base metal, uh, of precious or base metal discoveries. A drill target is based on a geological, geophysical, or a geochemical interpretation. So any combination of these interpretations can also be used. A drill target is first and foremost, foremost a target which is not verifiable by a field check. So a drill target is logically underground. 
An example here of Troilus within the Shibugemu area. So we have the drill holes that were added. And as each drill hole is added within the deposit, how the deposit is defined, how the geometry is defined. The first drill hole comes here in the middle. Well, we had this horizon. If we did not have the other drill holes around, we would have extended it straight down and straight up. But adding the lateral drill holes as seen here, it helps us to refine, to thin and uh, add a complexity within the geometry of the deposit as the data is drilled out and gives us more information on the deposit. Examples here of uh, worldwide uh, uh, longest drill holes. We have the case study in Kola Peninsula in Russia that was done between 1970 to 1994, with a total of uh, roughly 12,000 meters. And that was done basically for scientific goal, basically to extract the stratigraphy within an area to find out any um, also evidence for the climate changes using the isotopes uh, and things like that. So this is this land here is not used for uh, developing a mine and is mainly for scientific goals. Another example is offshore the Odok 2 in Russia, still in Russia, with 12,345 meters. In Canada, since uh, uh, late 2019, early 2020, we have in Quebec at the Windfall Project, the longest drill hole in Canada, which is the Deep Discovery one. It makes roughly 3,500 meters and it took six months to be drilled. This Discovery one drill hole added some information I would say added a lot of information under their intrusion, which was called the red dog, and was able to uh, pinpoint some mineralization under the uh, their underdog extension, which was one of the um, mineralized zone under the red dog, and was able to add some of the gold intercepts here and add also information along the way as the lithologies uh, and the places where they had alteration and structural uh, information. So the more, you, the, the more you add drill holes around areas, the more you're gonna refine your deposits. These are examples within a mine. So within an open mine, we can still use the same machinery as on the surface for exploration and with it, underground mining exploration, we have um, different tools, may, different tools using the main techniques, but from underground meaning we are most of the time gonna drill uh, upwards from the ground upwards along the ceiling or the walls. So when we talk about diamond drill hole uh, exploration, there is a lot of equipment first equipment to come in is everything that has to do for the setup of the diamond drill hole of the diamond drill itself before the hole is implanted so the diamond drill arrives in this kind of box we need to draw uh, to construct its platform plan its platform the box contains the main components of a drill the head frame the drill and its engine the water pump, the winch to lift the rods, and the tubing or the, known as the casing for the overburden. The casing, as shown here, is just a tube. It just, it prevents the overburden to infiltrate the hole when the casings are being removed. Here is a, just a cut a cross section within the head frame uh, showing all these units of the components of a drill. So we have the head frame, we have the winch, the water pump, the outer tube, and the inner tube. 
So the diamond drill hole, this is my abbreviation for diamond drill hole, DDDH. So the diamond drill hole diameter versus core diameter, that is also very important to understand. Whatever drill hole diameter we choose to work in an area is designed by these abbreviations and there are more. These are the common ones, uh, AQ, BQ, NQ, HQ, and PQ. Each one, each codification has their own diameters in millimeters. Once we have this outer tube here, we can see that the inner tube, the inside where the core is gonna come out is smaller. Logically, the core diameter is always smaller than the diamond drill hole diameter. So if someone says roughly we're working with NQ, well, you know that the, core, the drill hole diameter the tube, the outside tube is 76 millimeters and the inner core coming out cannot be higher than 48 meters. So the drilling cost is proportional to the diameter of the ring. The higher the drilling diameter, the higher the cost. But at the same time, the better resolution of a sample and understanding what is going on, especially for structure and for mineralization. So sometimes uh, a campaign is done using one general size and bigger size are used to go within some areas and do some more details. Here I included a video that you can go see on your own time showing a diamond drill hole full rotation in full rotation and how it works. And this is just uh, the samples coming out. So the core samples and the site or the platform set up for the drill. So for diamond drill hole, we're gonna go through some of the process, the importance of water. If we don't have any water, we don't have any diamond drill hole. So the role of water is to prevent diamond crown to burn or polish. It allows the sludge out of the hole and prevents the core from sticking in the core barrel. The water issues can be when the core barrel is full, the water is instantly blocked. In fractured rock, fragments can block the water. And in brittle rocks, the increase should be slow to get a good core recovery. The lack of water has the effect of poor debris removal, of overheating the crown and premature wear, and to have a poor core recovery. The excess water has the effect of eroding the walls of the hole, which can increase the deviation of the hole. And it has a poor core recovery too. The drilling speed depends on the type of rock being drilled. So if we are within a very hard rock like granite, the drilling speed is roughly two centimeters per minute. If we are within, within our soft rock like shells, the drilling speed can go up to 10 centimeters per minute. So to start any diamond drill hole, we need to be able to implement its location. We have several ways nowadays to locate a drilling site. The most rapid way is the GPS, which is which can be able to locate anywhere a drilling site with an accuracy of few centimeters to few meters. And with higher performing GPS, we can go to a few millimeters. We also have the aerial photographs and using the cut grind line system that, that I showed the, in the last uh, lessons. And we can also uh, when we are more in advanced projects, we can also position the uh, diamond drill holes by using the service of licensed surveyors to survey uh, our drill holes. And it is best this way, best method to, pr to have a precise location, which is normally demanded within uh, advanced uh, mining projects by the engineers. It is also the most expensive way. Once the drill is positioned 
on the ground, we must provide to the contractor the azimuth on which a dip must be applied to achieve the desired drilling. So the azimuth can be provided either using a GPS with an accuracy of a few degrees or manually with a compass with an accuracy of a few minutes. We need to implant in front and at rear of the target, of the drill hole target, we need to implant a guide for the driller to follow to make sure it uses the uh, chosen azimuth. So the first thing to check is the drill hole, diamond drill hole azimuth. The drill hole should never start if the bearing is not enabled by a member of the crew. And the angle of the drill map or the drill of, of the drill itself has to be horizontal and diamond drill holes starting dip should be validated before drilling the overburden casing. Once the hole is in progress, drilling angles is the only element to be validated and these drilling angles are known as the survey or the deviation. The ongoing drilling angles uh, between the azimuth and the dip as a function of the measured depth along the diamond drill hole trace. So the deviation is the ongoing drilling, drilling angle as a function of the measured depth along the DDH trace. So to understand that, I've included this figure so that we can see the difference between true vertical depth and measured depth. True vertical depth is if you are standing here on the surface and you are measuring one kilometers down, going vertically down, with no angle, your true depth is zero to 1,000. If we are measuring along a drill hole trace, 1,000 along a drill hole trace would be a different location than the true vertical depth. And that is easily explained because once you start a drill hole, unless your drill hole is perfectly vertical, the depth would be the same. But most drill, drill hole have this, uh, a difference in their angle surveys or they have a devi what we call a deviation. So 1,000 meters along the trace of the drill hole, once the drill hole deviates from the original strike down, the 1,000 meter could be anywhere else than where the true vertical depth is in function or based on the angle of that deviation. So that's important to understand. The deviation of the drill holes, the drill hole will always have a tendency to change course to find its easiest path easiest path and the less energy. So it is a bit lazy and will try to fall within the weaker part of the rocks. So why do holes deviate? Depending on the drilling parameters, the pressure within the ground, the diameter used to drill, the length of the hole and the dip used. The longer or the deeper the holes, the more they're gonna deviate the steeper the dips, the more they're going to deviate versus uh, sub-vertical or vertical uh, drill holes. The equipment used uh, also can uh, influence the deviation of a hole. So between the core barrel, the shell, the hexagonal and the bits. The operators, operators mostly or the drillers are paid by the meters that they are drilling. So often they are pushing, they are applying more pressure, they are increasing the rotation speed, uh, increasing the water pressure to go faster. So these can, can also influence the drill hole to deviate. And also the natural rock mechanics. If we have faults, the difference between units hardness, the anisotropy between units, so it is a complete science to understand why the hole was deviated. Example here, we have the example here from a 3D. So we have our plan view, horizontal plan view with the collar. The collar is where the drill hole starts towards the azimuth that it will be drilled. So here it will be drilled directly west. We have the plan view and the planned section of that same drill hole in a 
normal uh, theoretical world, we want to drill this hole at 60 degrees, constant 60 degrees going down. In reality, if we project the end of that hole, the end result is that it started here and went good, it went good for a while, but then it was deviated. And if we look at that same section, we can see that this deviation took place too within the rocks, which is normal because it, it adapted itself to the environment. So the deviation mainly, we have a deviation either in azimuth or dip or both. Examples here, normally a diamond drill hole tend to deviate perpendicularly to the rock units beds. So you can see here in red we have hard rocks and in blue we have softer rocks. So the difference in deviation between B and A, we can see that the deviation is more uh, pronounced in B than in A. And the reason is easily explainable by the hard rock, which prevents the drill string from deviating too much in A. So the first part here does not deviate, deviate at all, but when it falls within the softer rock, it tends to slide or lay at a more abrupt uh, angle. And within the alternating rocks, unit beds, the borehole would always orient itself perpendicular to the bend. So here we have the opposite. We're going into a soft rock and once it hits the hard rock, it tends to perpendicularize itself to the unit. The highly sloped deposits are the worst case scenario for drilling work and are extremely complicated for the air or water circulation losses for the difficulty in cleaning and blocking of the drilling column, and also for the bars that tend to follow the fractures or faults, which will undoubtedly result in distorted shots and bended drill rods, with high risk of rupture in the areas of greater stress at any point of tension. So as we see here, as the drill hole is going in, we can see that it's getting, the, the rods are getting bended, and they um, try to fit in within the drill hole, which are harder here and softer here. So the rotary equipment has an advantage in drilling fractured rock units because the annular area is smaller and therefore the return velocity of the air with crushed material is very high. So it has a higher sweep speed and it helps the shot to be cleaned before particles settle into cracks or fracture zones. We also use directional drilling. I'm showing here an example coming from the petroleum um, domain, but because it helps visually understand what directional drilling is, is mainly we start from one main drill hole and this example here, we have our petroleum platform with the main drill holes. And what we do as a certain depth, we know that our deposit is horizontally to a lateral extension, and we want to reach that extension. So we apply a voluntary directional uh, force to force the drill hole to reach these known deposits at this directions and depth. So the directional drilling is defined as an art and science involving deflection of a well bore in a specified direction in order to reach a predetermined object below the surface of the earth. This directional drilling is, this technique is mainly used if the target is located in inaccessible locations like on the river, under lakes, uh, under riverbeds, under lakes, under cities, under mountains, etc. So it is a way to set our drill hole to be to respect the environment away from the shores, away from the cities, um, without destroying the environment, and be able to reach the target at depth using uh, directional drilling methods. 
We also have the multilateral drilling showing here again from the petroleum, but this can also be used uh, often underground to have one main drill hole going into the different drafts, mine drafts, and going to reach deposits at the levels, the desired levels where it is present. So multilateral drilling is a well more than one horizontal or near horizontal laterals drilled from single site and connected back to a single well bore. Uh, it, is, it, it helps us to be faster, to exploit more. And this air example is petroleum, so reservoir, but in our case would be deposits. Um, and we only drill one, one main hole on the surface while underground we have a, 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 ch a channel of um, drill holes. We have several methods used. We'll see. You can. Uh, I put the link to the uh, techniques, and you can go see them on your uh, own time if you are interested. So we have the deviation of diamond drill holes measuring surveys with several techniques using the easy shot reflex. So it is. It is mainly used, but not within the magnetic rocks because it is not accurate. We then, we then have access to what we call the easy gyro, which drills right, uh, which is another technique. And the only thing to have to be careful is the drill vibration can have an impact on the measured data. Uh, the correction of deviations, um, we have several ways to do that uh, because uh, mainly it is important to understand that it is unrealistic to think that a borehole will go directly where we want it to go. So therefore we need to define a tolerance range zone or a buffer zone uh, that should be defined based on a set distance around the target to reach. So the buffer zone where the drill hole is considered successful if it is located inside. Depending on the tolerance zone, it will help or not the drill to reach the targeted area. We decide on using correction orientation surveys, keeping in mind the orientation of a drill hole is actually a three-dimensional vector. So, uh, three methods exist to correct the orientation. We have the drilling using bevel drills or wedge bits. So these, these are crown diamond a uh, triangle cylindrical shape, which gives a natural tendency to deflect the drill according to the rotation. Um, the drilling is classified out of control in the monitoring of the deviation. We cannot predict if we can only do what we have and by cons, it is the least expensive. Mainly what we use in exploration are the drilling using metal corners or the wedges. When a relatively accuracy is required, a corner is a large metal rod bevel several meters long that is inserted into the borehole and the drill string above the drill slide by hardness dif difference for the, from the rock being softer than steel, this corner is oriented to align the hole in, direct, in the right direction. We can also use drilling oriented electronically. So these uh, are examples of corners wedges where they straighten a borehole and the deviation if it is too important uh, and save time and money in the deep. So these are the wedges that are inserted. Wedges are also used a lot in exploration if we are doing a hole. And once we have reached the um, interesting areas is we don't want to drill more than uh, required holes on the surface, but underground, we need to verify the lateral extent of our deposits. So we insert these wedges to go from our direct hole. The wedges can also be used from one year to another to start one year at a certain depth, depending on our budget or the, the investigation we want to do, and then go back the next year and either continue that same hole at, a long, at the same deviation or insert wedges and also to 
um, add any geophysical or geochemical analysis. Um, we have the directional drilling. We'll see the video at the end of this presentation. So when the core, once we have the core, the drill hole set up, how do we take care of the rock that comes out of the drill hole known as the core? We need to have a system to store that core. So the core is described by the geologist or what we say logged and sampled and its storage should be done appropriately for future references. So what, what we need to understand is that these cores cost several thousands of dollars so we cannot just uh put them on the side without any reference or archiving system we need to be able to go back to the information if we need to take any pictures any measurements so it has to be a rigorous work to make sure we are going back to the right drill hole and the right core so the core is stored in core boxes fitting the drill holes core size that too is important so that the boxes, uh, the core stays uh, well in the boxes. The core boxes are stacked in racks within a core shack. The core boxes are classified using a rigorous archivist system, using systems as systematic as books in a library. And where, whenever geologist needs to go back to historical drill core to validate their interpretations, they can go back, find their drill holes, uh, go back in the shacks, and uh, they can re-observe any of the past drill holes and do new, new observations. So that would be a re-log, new interpretation. And this is an ongoing process. Many of the drill holes are logged and re-logged through time, depending on the interpretation that changes and the additional work or data that helps us uh, advance in our in interpretations. So this is the storage uh, or the racks. We have our boxes here. Each boxes have an aluminum plate with the numbers, with the drill hole number, and the front two from where we have the core. And these are put within the racks, and all these racks are um, put within a system, either Excel or a, a geodatabase that helps us know exactly where these cores are placed on the field. So going back to exploration stages, uh, if we, we start, we can start drilling programs saying, I'm going to start, I am, I'm working in a new area. I'm going to start just a preliminary work because I have no idea what's going on. So that's for the first orientation, our research exploration work. We can use simple uh, drilling processes like the Sonic or the OJ, or even the RC, the reverse circulated uh, techniques. For advanced uh, projects, and we want to validate our work, we call it the recognition drilling. Drillings are made to establish stratigraphic sections and ecological information. And within the investigation area, we want to add as much geology, geophysics, and geochemical information to help us refine um, either the units or also to try to define new potential drilling targets within area area. So as much as the geology is uh, refined or complex and the geometry changes, the more data we have, the more drill holes we implant, the more of that precision is going to be validated. Uh, for exploration stages, and when we use diamond drill hole for verifying uh, drilling targets, again, like I showed earlier, uh, the drilling shows the presence or absence of a mineralization. So the more we have drill holes within an area of a known deposit, 
the more we're going to be able to refine the shape of that particular deposit and the limits of that deposit, the, the places where the deposit is present and absent, and wherever that deposit was uh, deformed structurally by the presence of a fault, and where we have some alteration around that known deposit. So if encouraging signs are revealed, that meaning good results, good results in whatever uh, mineral we are looking for, the target is a mineralized zone which needs a follow-up. The art of targeting here, it's just I'm doing a little parenthesis here to understand that Generally, a radius buffer of 30 meters is used as the target zone, depending on the particular requirement. Example here, if our target is set up here and we are starting our drill hole where we can impose a directional drilling on our drill hole to reach that target, we need to define our buffer zone. The smaller our buffer zone is, the harder it is going to be and the longest it's gonna to take to reach our target. So the smaller the target, the greater the number of correction runs is needed, the longer drilling time and the higher drilling costs. In a realistic world, we would define our targets and we would define a larger buffer zone. Having a larger buffer zone box will enable us to have our main drill hole to apply a directional drilling a technique on it to control the survey of the trace of the drill hole, but we have a larger area or a larger buffer zone where if our drill hole fall into, we say it has reached our target. So the target zone should be as large as a geologist can allow. And the driller's job is to try its best to place the drill hole within the target zone at a minimum cost. Example here of an evaluation drilling. Evaluation drilling is a step farther when we know that we have mineralization and we want to be able to delineate and sample that mineralization zone usually to determine its tonnage, its grade, and to evaluate whether it is a, a good deposit to be mined or not. So this evaluation drilling, as we can see from the samples here, as we see their colors, um, is the concentration in gold. So these are used using a threshold value to let us draw the mineralized envelope as we see here. But again, we have some areas where we have more data, which help us refine the shape of the, uh, or the geometry of the mineralized envelope. And where we go from one drill hole to the next drill hole, and there's a hole in between, a hole meaning there is no data. So if we have no data, from one drill hole to the other, we can extrapolate and say and interpret that until we have new data, we assume that this deposit follows from this drill hole to the next. But this hole is seen geologically as a hole, as a missing data. So it could be a place as we say, okay, next time we're gonna implant a hole, we're gonna make sure we're gonna have a drill hole passing through this empty no data area to verify and make sure the deposit is continuous from this hole to the next. For economic reasons, this hole is also known as open, meaning since we don't have any drill holes, there is no way to say that the deposit is not continuous from this drill hole to this drill hole. So sometimes these open without information are also speculative because we cannot disprove that the mineral envelope is not continuous. 
So it is like an ongoing process of adding more data, interpreting, and trying to refine all these places where we have less data and adding more data. So that's the main process of the evaluation drilling. When we, have, we are into pre-production drilling, all these openings where we have no drill holes or no data are uh, economically positive because speculatively we say it is open. Until there is a drill hole that's going to add on here or any place where it's known as open and tell us is a deposit still there or not, this is worth a lot of money. So pre-production drilling, the ore deposit is moving toward the mine stage. Additional drilling better defines the deposit and, and reserves estimation, geotechnical and metallurgical investigations and tracking the possible development of the mine is planned on these. The mine drilling. The drilling continues to delineate additional blocks and to get the information to plan the implementation of the mine. Mine drilling, you have to understand, is not coincidental. It is not like the exploration drilling. Mine drilling, we don't want to waste money. We want to produce more mineral. So mine drilling is done on uh, interpersonal, low-risk work as exploration drilling is done on interpersonal work, but we want to test some of our knowledge, some of our models, we're not always sure. Going back now to how to prepare our drilling sites. So coming into a region where there is no mine, no works, we need to put in the less field activities footprint as we can. So in small areas, we need to build uh, drilling platforms. So it must be a large enough to allow the safe operation of the drill and whichever equipment we need to bring in, like bulldozers or skidders. The diameter of a drilling platform type is usually between 20 and 40 meters and the transportation of the drill in is done in the forest. Sometimes when we are into remote areas, the drill is disassembled and brought into within the uh, studied area with a helicopter. So it is transported to the site and reassembled on the site. And it needs a little more space to work with more uh, safely. So between 40 to 50 meters. The drilling sites are established based on four main criteria. Targets, validations of the physical performance of the drills the rules of, on health and safety, the forestry management rules and les legislations, and finally, the environmental rules and les legislations. So, uh, the, we're gonna go, we're gonna see B, C, and D. A, we're gonna see, we saw some of it so far, and I'll show some later on. So the rules on health and safety, the CSST standards apply to all drilling sites and the drilling sites workplace are similar to construction sites. So drilling contractors must be registered, providing personal protection and ensure the implementation of health and safety standards. You must ensure that the contractor complies with all the act. So the act, I've put a link here for the Quebec uh, province. For the forestry management rules and legislations, the important criteria to respect are that the license to forest innovations are, are signed by a forest engineer, protection of wildlife habitats, protection of the banks, lakes, and rivers. So there is a minimum distance that we're allowed to drill from a, a water bank, um, the forest road construction, the layout and construction of roads and the size and location of cutting areas. The rules for forestry management uh, in Quebec, you know, we have to remember that the forest is separated into public or private. So for forest integration rules for public domain are, are governed by 
regulation, and private owners can also intervene. All the standards are defined in the regulation respecting the standards in the forest, and I've listed both uh, links below. For the environmental standards, the certificate of authorization uh, are required. Uh, so these include everything that has to do with etching or drilling in ponds, marshes, swamps, and uh, the um, distance we need to, or the area also that we need to uh, respect, drilling a, within a lake or buffer strip, the pumping of water from river or lake, and also uh, the roads or highways access if uh, we are in a water environment, and the size of the bulk samples, depending on the type of uh, study we are doing. You are responsible as the prime contractor for the implementation of the Environmental Quality Act again, so I've put a link also here for the, the act to respect. Other considerations that are important also for everything that has to do with environment are that companies often choose to leave the casing into the ground, as shown here. Leaving the casing into the ground allows companies to use for subsequent follow-ups to deepen the hole, if we want to go back and add some wedges. But also, like I said, to add any other uh, studies or surveys or measurements, either geophysical or geochemical, if they do so, they must mark the casing so that the casing is visible regardless of the seasons that we are going back on the field. The water pumps can be installed on the banks of lakes, rivers, or streams, and uh, the water pump is pumped into resist resistant hoses to the drill. So they have to be to ensure that the, the pump, the, the hoses don't break. The ponds can be dug on the drilling site. The, the wastewater containing the surface rock will be dumped at first and then solids can be deposited thereon. The liquid and scrape and drilling mud that are left behind must be limited to at least 30 meters from any waterway or permanent water. So how do we define a typical drilling campaign strategy? I have included the steps here. So with all the lessons we've seen so far from one to six, everything is gonna make more sense now. So we're always gonna work from bigger scale, so the regional geological information scale, to whichever uh, area or size study that we want to go. We also always have to look at the big picture first to know the regional elements, and then we zoom in within the area or the study area that we are working. Zooming into that study area, we are still looking at all the local geology and historic works. And that includes once we are, we are working with the drill holes, not just the geology, the rock units and the structure, but it also we also include now any position of uh, prior or historical mines with their elements. So we can also superpose on our geological map any of the known elements and their mineralized environment. So if we are looking at gold, what type of gold are we looking at? Here, example, if we are looking at the yellow, it is gold, silver, and plus or minus silver and copper within shear zones. We expect to have shear zones along known regional shear zones. So these alignments are not coincidental. They are uh, respecting or validating the shear zone geological interpretation. So we have all within our local study area, we try to uh, show all the elements that can help us to define our targets. So whichever elements that can help in the area, 
uh, the types of here uh, copper gold from polymetallic uh, uh, deposit associated to uh, veins, the porphyry copper gold, and the VMS copper zinc uh, gold deposits. So knowing all this and going into a region and wanting to add more information, we still have to look at what's going on and not work with blinders on. We still have to know the work that was previously done and the interpretations that was previously done. So the data we're going to use all the geological data that can be compiled, so coming from all the known outcrops, all from the prior drill holes, everything that has been sampled, the rock samples, either for geochemical samples, the soil samples, etc., the till samples, and so on. So the more information, the more layers you add, the more you're going to be able to uh, define precise uh, targets. To that, you can add all the uh, types of surveys. So if we move on, we have the geophysical data compilation and the geophysical data compilation uh, can be very voluminous because there are so many different geophysical uh, techniques. So that can add, again, several types of layers depending on the extension of the survey and the type of survey used and if it was used as a as a surface survey or an aerial regional survey when we when we superpose both the geophysical survey and the geological survey plus now we have the mineralized survey uh, these kind of start to uh, pinpoint some areas where all three or all uh, total layers used are intersecting within areas that show clear anomalies. And we want to explain these anomalies. So these would be like our uh, highest rank priorities targets to be next to be drilled and to be verified. Example here, here we have no data uh, no additional drill holes, it would be good areas to drill. Uh, so drilling a geophysical anomaly, we have a geophysical anomaly here, we have no drill holes, so we would set up our grid and then we would pinpoint our planned drill holes, putting in the starting color where we want our drill hole to start and then we would make sure to plan our drill holes where our historical drill holes are not interest, intersecting with our new drill holes. Examples here is again, here again of uh, newly drilled anomalies, adding new data in 3D because that's important if we want to implement drill holes within a study area we have many tools, easy tools now to visualize uh, any anomaly we want to visualize and with our planned drill holes. So here, if they plan some, we have our target here and they seem to have planned all their drill holes to be uh, vertical or sub-vertical knowing that the main target is here. So that would be good for this area. But if we would be working in an area where the core here is not reachable or attainable from the surface, we would need to start our drill hole farther in the lateral extent and try to deviate the drill hole underground to reach that target. So the 3D view of any planned drill hole is also very helpful. Another map here showing the superposition of our geophysical anomalies, uh, the higher anomalies with the structure, with the geology, and areas where we have more drill holes than others. If we move on, move on also now to adding the geochemical anomalies, in this case, we don't have the geophysics. In this case, we have the geology and the geochemical anomalies. 
Well, we have in the background, if we look at the legends, that's why the legend is also very important, is first we can see the disposition of our main units, our rocks. So we have our rhyolites, so our felsic rock units, felsic volcanic units. We have our andesites here in the light green, so intermediate, intermediate volcanic rocks. And we have an intrusion, our batalite or our quartz monzonite intrusion here. What we can also see within our legend is that we have a strong fracture area, which is darker, uh, uh, the hatch, darker hatch, and we have a weak fracture area with a light, lighter hatch, and we have alteration zones within these hatches. So the superposition of the higher alteration, lower alteration, and fresh rocks are great areas to pinpoint where we want our drill holes to pass through and to uh, reach out these intersections, the longest intersections, to have or try to have our highest values in gold and our longest thickness of that value in gold, which are both important. Here is a good example uh, in both surface and 3D of how we would go about in, in, uh, in an area. So we want to drill here our geochemical anomalies, but we also have geophysical anomalies and we have our surface uh, information that was surveyed. So uh, in plan view, what we can see is we have our five planned drill holes that was done or traced using the geophys geophysical models of the magnetic, which is in blue here, uh, anomalies, the IP in orange, the anti-resistivity in green, and we have in the background in pink, the 3D geochem. So the intersections of all these anomalies where we have the more intersections are the highest strength targets. We have the position here of the discovery outcrop where we had some nice values. We have the surface copper mineral occurrences where we have the higher values. We uh, also have the zones of higher copper, gold and molybdenum concentrations here as shown in the uh, mineral legend. So this would help us define where we should target and where we want these drill holes to go through. So if we cut through that area, we can see we want our drilling site to start here. So the planned drill hole will test the major geochemical and geophysical anomalies that extend beneath the surface mineralization. In the cross section here, what we see is looking north, northeast, we see the drilling site location. All our planned drill holes are gonna start from that same site. We wanna target one and two, we have target one and two, but we wanna add some more, a little bit more information. So that's why we're adding uh, other drill holes around. So we have planned four drill holes here. And we are basically doing, like I said, the intersection between all the geophysical and the geochemical, geochemical uh, anomalies to pinpoint where uh, our highest ranking targets are. So uh, the metallogenic synthesis of a study area is very important. That we'll see in the next lesson. But for today is just to show it as, as we think that our deposit, our next deposit is gonna fall, depends on what is uh, present in the area, the type of uh, mineralized environment we are working in. And is it gold? Is it copper? Uh, are we working within disseminated sulfurs? massive semi massive sulfides what type of deposit are we working in that will help us also uh, plan our next 
uh, drill holes. Once we have all that data coming in from the drilling, we need to uh, archive the data to not just the cores. So we need to be able to use all that information and later on to cr crush or process that information to help us validate our geology and define new targets. So many softwares are available and these softwares mainly contain the projects, their drill holes, um, uh, all the specs of the drill holes, their starting colors, the deviations of the colors, uh, where was the, uh, the front two in which box it is, pictures of each boxes, where were the samples taken, so where are the analysis taken and the analysis back from the labs and so on, the description from the geologist and so on. So everything is ni nicely kept within a uh, compiled database. Target drilling, it's designed to intersect towards an exploration target identified by a geological interpretation or geochemical and geophysical anomalies. Drill holes are planned for each target. So we have our target and then we have our target buffer zone. The more we're going to add drill holes within an area, the more we're going to be able to refine or define the geometry of our deposit. And we're going to move away from blubber, uh, no shape targets to more refined, defined geometry and it's shape and it's orientation and it's dip. So the drill hole spacing resolution is very important. When we work into an area that we are starting, of course, we're going to have less drill holes and it's going to be hard to interpret the, the data just from one drill hole. We need to have a regular spaced resolution to help us understand what is going on within the system, to help us see and pinpoint any change in azimuth, orientation, angle, and so on, thickness within a deposit, which is very important too. So the drill hole spacing resolution is determined by the accuracy of the data sought, depending on the complexity of the targets. The more the deposit is complex, the more drill hole it's going to take, the more um, stable or constant is the shape and, and simple is the shape of a deposit, the less drill hole it's going to take. A good example here of a drill hole, a drill or a drilling pattern within an area, and how many drill holes do we need to input within an area to define um, a deposit. We're going to start with random. If we're going to start in a new area, we're going to maybe check if this is the limit of our study area. We're going to at least have one on both ends and maybe a couple more in the center. Uh, and then we're going to start seeing that if the geometry of our deposit is not constant, complex, the thickness varies, from this to here, from this drill hole to this drill hole, we, see, we already see that if we only have four or five drill holes, we cannot come out with this complex and precise contour of our mineralized envelope. So our drilling pattern goes from a random to a statistical, more exploration approach and more systematic drilling. The more we, see we stand from initial project to mine, this uh, drilling patterns pattern becomes less and less random and more systematic. Other things, adding drill holes within the system, as we can see here, the drill holes here help define the exact change of orientation or dip of a deposit and also helps limit the deposit or the mineralized envelope. 
these drill holes are very precious because they help us see that the deposit is finished and is not continuous and we move on to black shells. So the, we can say that this side here, the deposit is closed. When we don't have any more data here or any more drill holes because the drill holes are not all the same length, Yes, we can interpret here that the black shell is continuous because we have no information, but this area, I would consider it still to be open, like this area here, since I have no drill hole passing through here and confirming that we're really going from the mineralized envelope to the black shell. So, again, the absence of data here is a hole in itself. And it is in very important once you go from random early exploration stage to systematic early mining stage to have less and less of these holes or holes in data and make sure you know or control your mineralized envelope. Orientation holes. So these are mainly added to direct the drill, to drill the least waste rock before reaching the target. We try to remain perpendicular to the target and to get a true thickness and to reduce the drilling length while passing through the same thickness of rocks. And these are used when we have, again, mineralized envelopes that are very complex with changing shapes, uh, orientations, dips, changing thicknesses, and being themselves deformed and along faults and being moved upwards or downwards along any uh, different types of faults. So being able to direct uh, our drill hole as much as we can will also help us define or refine our uh, mineral deposits. Example here of orientation hole, if we would say that the tree gray are deposits, if we implant here on the surface our color, uh, our drill hole color, and we do a vertical uh, hole, yes, we're going to reach one of our deposit, not even three of them. And we're going to reach it really late in our exploration. It's going to take more time, more money, and we're going to find fewer deposits. If we know that our deposits are situated here at this angle and this dip, we can, at a certain distance, calculate the exact angle to use to deviate our hole and to make sure our hole would pass through perpendicular to all three segments of our mineralized zone, and this will take lesser time and lesser money. So to try to remain perpendicular to the target and to get a true thickness and reduce the drilling length while passing through the same thickness of rocks. We don't drill without an execu execution plan. And no drill is done without having uh, everything done with the permits, the impacts on the environment, how long it's going to take, and which budget we need to respect. So again, all this is pre-planned, pre-defined before the drill even goes on the field. And this is all done within a software again. And once the drill has started, the ongoing live drilling program is updated within that software. So we go from a planned drill hole to a drilled drill hole. And as the drill hole is, is drilled, the information of the from to, the depths, the total depth, and so on are live, ongoing, adjusted uh, day by day. Uh, any dip deviation uh, tests to make sure the survey is going the right way are added as the tests are done, and any uh, other tests like geophysical, here is an example of these uh, mag susceptibility, 
and the measurements are inserted right away live also within the software. The target definition. So what do we need? Again, our little resume here. We need the geological maps of surface outcrops. We need anything that has to do with air and ground geophysical surveys, uh, any method used, so MAG, EM, electrical. The geochemical surveys, any surveys that was done, so rock, till, lake bottom, sediments, etc. Any historical diamond drill hole that was done in the area should also be included in your project. The surface deposits map should always be within the project. Anything else that is visual and will add any information as how close are you from a lake, a river, a stream, a road, a, a train track, whatever, photo, aerial, satellite imagery, and anything with Google Maps that helps you localize yourself, it's always needed. And you have to keep in mind that deposits are rare, complex, hidden, and hard to find. It's not an easy task. Example here from the case study from the ABDP, ABDP Mature Mining Camp. So we have here the extension of the known mines from Rouen Oranda to Val d'Or. In between, we have Malartic and Bousquet-Laron. So we have the main regional um, uh, faults, the uh, well-known catalog break here. We have the positions of all the prior mines and all the known deposits. So we have their spacing and this would be like a first view, big scale, regional scale, what's going on, how are our stuff, where, where are mines, how are they spaced and so on. And then we can move on to whichever region we need to study to a smaller scale. And example here, if we're moving into, from the Doyon to La Ronde area, we have a, a section view here, looking north, with the west, east, and with the topography and the uh, uh, down underground view, with all the deposits, the known deposits. From that, what we can do is we already know the um, geometry of these deposits. If we want to implant new uh, drilling or targets, what we have to do is that the mineral deposit must take into consideration the size, the shape, the orientation of the deposit, which is studied, as well as the size of its associated alteration hollow. So to that, any information that we can add uh, in mind, everything that has to do with 3D when we have their envelopes, either the mineralized envelope and the alteration envelope and the structural and mine development also to make sure we are drilling at the right place. So in this case, the mineralized envelope is pretty simple, um, meaning it is sub-vertical, doesn't seem to change that much, doesn't seem to be too complex in shape, and this would be needed to, to be seen to make sure that if we decide to add a drill hole, we know exactly where we want to target and where we want it to hit. So this we're going to see in two weeks, but I just wanted to make sure so people would understand, depending on the metallogenic model we're using, if we, even if we are working in gold, gold can be present in several types of metallogenic model. So depending on the model we're gonna use or think we are in, we need to use different drilling approach or drilling targets to make sure we reach the next um, gold uh, deposit or envelope. So if we are into a parallel system, into a chimney system, a uh, vein system, stock system, uh, intersection system between intrusion and, and structures, uh, curvy planner systems, a battlelet system, or the malartic type system, we need to define or use a new approach to drill it. 
So once we have all these geological, geophysical, geochemical anomalies, we create a map that's called potential maps. To that potential maps, uh, they're used to help us uh, prioritize our targets and rank our targets. So again, like all other maps, our coloring is based from cooler to warmer colors, cooler being the background, which are the areas not interesting in pushing on the exploration targeting, and the warmer colors being areas which would be important or are highly favorable to have mineralization. These should be superposed to um, our known maps where there has been known work. So this is the map of the Valdal area. So this would be interesting to superpose the area where there has already been some uh, drill holes and it would make us see areas where we see holes. Holes meaning in this uh, in this uh, meaning like I showed earlier, holes in data. Holes that say, hmm, it would be interesting to insert a, a new drill hole because there could be some potential and there is no one that has been looking at it. And holes meaning, does that deposit continue on to this deposit? And because here it is, it has been stopped because and it's still open because there is no data between the two. So this is an example. A good point to see also to remember is when we plan a drill hole, we have to be careful um, using the field topography and overburden. So if we plan a drill hole, if, if our surface target is here, projected target on the ground, projected on the surface, and we are not using the original or true topography and field overburden thickness, we might not drill at the right place. That's what this figure is showing. So we might include our drilling here, but because we didn't take into consideration our uh, rock overburden true field a thickness and shape, we might, we might not reach our real target. If we project this onto the surface, we project at the right place, but underground, we are not at the place where we wanted to target. And what we need also to be careful is, are you targeting using a known dip from your projected target on the surface? Or are you targeting not knowing the dip of your deposit? If you're working in a new place, you don't always have that information. So what do you do? If you have the known dip, well, that is easy. You have your target projected on the surface. You have your dip. So you calculate at X uh, depth where your target is supposed to be using that angle. And then you plan your drill hole and you should pass through your target. If you don't have a uh, known target, then you will need to have more than one drill hole to make sure that your projected target from the surface with your drilling will intersect an interesting area and this would be your targeting zone or buffer and then you would be able to know as you add more drill holes to know more about the geometry and the uh, dip of your mineralized zone. So this, I'm gonna go through this. So this I just wanted to show you in real life, uh, some of the best examples of gold within the cores that I have ever seen in my life or my career so far comes from the windfall project of Cisco in Quebec. And uh, usually uh, most of my, uh, or any geologist uh, core logging experience, gold is hard to see. 
uh, visible, visible gold, what we call VG. It's hard to see with the eye. You need to have good eye, or most of the time you need to have a good uh, uh, in loop. I don't remember the word in English. At windfall, well, m most of the time you can be like a foot away and you would be able to pinpoint your gold. There are so many gold. Example here is um, uh, the gold we see is the analysis came back to 236 gram over 0.4 meters. So the concentration of the gold is always expressed on the length measured along the drill hole trace, like I showed before, and not the true vertical thickness. Here on the, on the right side, we have 197, 197 gram per ton of gold over 0.3 meters of gold. Next one here, we have 677 gram per ton over 0.4 meters. The one on the, on the right is very spectacular because this one here, you have uh, 9,830 grams per ton over 0.3 meters. And you can see that the gold, there are so many gold, you can even use the gold to determine or validate your structural um, control within the area, which is pretty uh, phenomenal. A good example here, I wanted to show also an example in 3D, how your core comes out. So you have the polished zone of the core that was within the uh, core tube and the natural break of the core. And you can see the continuity of your gold content here, as seen here in 3D. So uh, before going to the videos, I just wanted to also add the roles and regulations of each person within a drill hole campaign, because it's not one person. It's a team job. When we have a drill hole campaign, we have a complete team working on that for a main goal. The geologist is known as the qualified person under the uh, National uh, 43 101 norms. And the geologist's role is to target selection on the basis of the geological evidence, geophysical and geochemical or, or other evidence and to ensure the quality of the project progress and the data processing. So a geologist will be in the core shack, taking the measures, taking the, the observations, making sure all the data is well put in the uh, geodatabase software. The geological technician is uh, there to support the geologists and is involved in a lot in the core shack activities helps a lot in the QRQC preparation if, uh, for the core uh, rack building, for the core storage, for the core uh, sawing, and various other works activities associated to the uh, drilling campaign, going on the field, preparing the site, getting the permits, and so on. All the necessary permits needed, uh, the, uh, depending on the area we are drilling, uh, the environment we are drilling, the technique we are using, and so on. Here are some of the permits for the activities needed. How to prepare our budget. So I've listed them all here. So you also have to be able to keep in mind and all the prices updated. These prices change over time changes over the cycles, changes uh, during times also when there are less um, labor or equipment and so on. The planning, the location planning and drilling sites, so all the maps need to be updated. Uh, could be the GIS maps, but also uh, I would recommend with anything that you're using for the treaty. Uh, follow-up of the project. So make sure that all your drilling, azimuths, dips, deviation, and everything is done. Uh, on the field, this is also has to be done. So the stakes 
for the guidelines for the driller, the drillers have to be uh, done on site and validated also on site so the driller don't make, don't make any mistakes. All the safety rules have to be uh, respected. So uh, everything that has to do with uh, any kind of emergencies, communication, visitors on the site, uh, supervision of the drilling and the quality, everything has to be respected. Oops, sorry about that. The drill holes, deviation control and management. So everything that has to do why a borehole has deviated. You cannot wait till the end of the borehole to be, be surprised that your drill hole was deviated. You have to follow it alive as it is drilled and react as it is deviated. If it doesn't matter, if it matters, depending on the study you are doing and applying the right methods to straighten your drill hole. If, if your buffer zone or your target is very small, you need to bring back your hole where towards your target. There are several ways or techniques to measure the orientation of the boreholes. Uh, and uh, the question that uh, is very important is making the decision to stop or continue a hole. And that is not a one person decision. It is often a team call. Do we stop or do we continue? The answer depends on the target we're looking for, on the geological characteristics and the environment we're working, of the previous holes around, if the, the geology is constant, uh, of our sections interpretation, our budget, and our program in time. So everything, that's why it's important to keep everything up to date because once we need to take a decision, we need to have all of this in our head and to make sure we're able to take that decision. A uh, picture here shows that we're going through mineralized uh, intervals. The mineralization ch seems to change orientation here from here. Here it is completely perpendicular to our units. Here it is parallel to our units. And then the more we drill, the more we advance, the more we are losing that mineralization, but we still have some. So this would be a decision. Uh, if we have reached the end of the plan depth, do we finish it here? Or are we curious because there are still some mineralization? Are we curious to see even if our plan depth was, let's say, uh, a thousand meters and we are over our thousand meters, do we have the money to continue? Do we have the time to continue? Are we within a rock unit uh, interesting to, to say, oh yeah, we're going to continue because we're still in our unit or we are completely changing unit and we know that changing unit, we're never going to see any mineralization again. So this is, again, it's not a decision that's done uh, on a site uh, after 30 seconds, we need to take all these considerations. So sometimes, depending on when we have reached the whole depth, especially sometimes when it reaches at night, completely in the middle of the night, we say to the driller, continue, and we'll take the decision tomorrow morning. Example of a uh, core shack, a well uh, classified core shack, so nothing is in the middle. No accident, accident, accident can be done because there are stuff in the middle. People are working, there are logging, technicians are taking some measures, some samples, and so on. So I've included at the end, I'm not going to go through everything one by one, but you have a main resume for each core logging description, what we are looking for. for. So for the rock description, what do we need to include? The basic of what we need to include and what we are looking for. So the name of the unit, color, texture, anything like you've seen in the past six lessons, everything that has to do with our work is all the observations that we can see and uh, pass on through our paper, notes, and database. So everything that is visible 
any alteration, any mineralization, and if you see any mineralization, what type of mineralization do you see? Any structures, uh, RQD, uh, any observations that are either qualitative or what we call quantitative. So qualitative, meaning you see it like a silicification, a chlorothization. Quantitative would be a percentage. How much pyrite do you see? How much uh, quartz veins do you see? And so on. The main geological rock units, what kind of rocks do you see? Keep it simple. And then, do you see any mineralized zone? If you do see mineralized zones, what do you see in the mineralized zones? Keep it simple too. Um, how much sulfides do you see? The percentage is very important because if you pass on some disseminated sulfides from semi-massive sulfides to massive sulfides, it depends on the concentration of these sulfides within the area. The RQD. RQD is the main uh, link, I would say, between a geologist and a, an, a mining engineer. So to know the classification of an environment, the gen engineer needs to know the RQD to know the stability of the mine or the rocks in the area. So this is the link between the RQD and the rock stability and the link between the geological terms and the uh, engineer terms. The core sampling procedures, the length of the sample, what do we do with the sample and so on, shipping of the sample, the core database and the digital description, what we need to put in our database, the core storage and retention. So how do we store? How do we keep our work safe? And now we're going to reach our, we're going to go through uh, two of the main videos. The other ones I'm going to let you go see by yourself. Uh, the last two are the longest ones. And these are if you want to push on your knowledge um, I encourage you to uh, consult them. We're going to view today the Divico is the one where we force uh, drilling uh, deviation within an area. And we're going to see the difference between the core diamond drill hole and the uh, uh, reverse circulation drill holes. So going to my video. So we're going to start with the direct directional. Core drilling is extremely valuable as an exploration method. But certain aspects make it slow and more expensive than necessary. Often, long sections must be drilled before reaching the target formation. In addition, natural deviation can change the drill path and reduce the value of the borehole. With Devico technology, you can complete a drilling program quicker and with higher accuracy than with traditional core drilling methods. Devico technology makes it possible to control borehole deviation and steer the hole accurately towards the target. At the same time, Core samples are collected during the steering process. When the first hole is finalized, it can be sidetracked and used again to steer towards a second target. Side tracking is easily performed by cutting straight in a curved section of the first hole. By using this method, no wedges or cement plugs are necessary. Making several branch holes may significantly reduce the length of a drilling program, leading to remarkable savings in both time and money. Devico technology has been used successfully all around the world. Our experience tells us you will be surprised by how easily directional core drilling can be implemented in your drilling program. The quality of your geological information will improve for a fraction of the price and with less impact on the environment.
And the second video is the one that will show the difference between diamond drill hole and the reverse circulation drill hole. Prior to the initiation of exploration operations, geologists often wonder what method of exploration drilling is the most effective and at the same time the least expensive. Core drilling, RC drilling, or a combination of these two methods. To help you make the right choice, Ak Niet Berga company offers an overview of the characteristics of each type of drilling. Core drilling, or also called diamond drilling, is a type of fast rotation drilling, the implementation of which results in the destruction of the rock within a ring pattern, but not over the entire bottom hole. In this mode of drilling, the interior of the rock in the form of core, a rock pile with an undisturbed structure, is fully preserved. For this purpose, the core is periodically get locked and isolated from the bottom and lifted up to the surface using a core receiver suspended on a rope from which the core is removed and distributed to core boxes. RC drilling, or also called reverse circulation drilling, is carried out using the air supplied through the rods with a reciprocating piston, a so-called air hammer used as the drilling mechanism rotating the drilling bit made of tungsten steel. When pressure is applied to the rod, an aerodynamic lift is generated by means of which the water rises up the annular space with the sludge rising within the inner tube, which is located inside each rod. Ideally, in the course of RC drilling, we obtain dry drill cuttings since the compressed air from the compressor dries rock in front of the drilling bit. The cuttings reach the reflector on the rig mast, move through the sampling hose and into the cyclone, followed by processing within the cyclone until released through the opening at the bottom, whereupon collected in a sampling bag. For comparison, during the drilling method with direct blowing, which is mainly used for the blast hole drilling cuttings, reach the earth's surface using the same air pressure, but through the annulus, where the sample is naturally contaminated. The most commonly used drilling bits for RC drilling have a diameter of 124 to 130 millimeters with protruding round metal buttons or pins. If we use in diamond drilling the average size of 95 millimeters, the core diameter is about 63 millimeters. Thus, comparing RC drilling and core drilling by the sample amount, RC drilling is characterized by the obvious superiority. It is also worth noting that unlike air hammer drilling, core drilling provides geologists with the opportunity to visually analyze samples since an undisturbed core structure provides a complete picture of the structure and rock occurrence. When exploring at shallow depths, RC drilling can be used independently without the aid of core drilling. When exploring to a greater depth, RC method is used as a cost-saving method of drilling in order to reach mineralization. After that, geologists may decide whether to continue RC drilling to extract cuttings or go shift to core drilling for the extraction of the core. In this case, RC drilling becomes a great addition to the normal core drilling. Due to a number of the factors mentioned above, RC drilling method is cheaper than core drilling and therefore it is preferred in the exploration of mineral resources. The choice of method used in the exploration and assessment work depends on whether drilling is performed from the surface or from mines, on the geological features of the deposit, hole depth 
the complexity and the category of drillability of rocks as well as preferences of the geologist. Modern coring rigs allow for fast and efficient coring to a sufficient depth from holes of different diameters. At the same time, RC drilling has become so progressive and advanced that more and more geologists believe that to determine the mineral composition of rocks, RC cuttings are enough. Taking all the aforesaid into consideration, we should say that drilling from the surface offers a choice of cuttings, core, or a combination thereof. Underground RC drilling is certainly technically possible, but until now has been used to a very limited extent. And that ends uh, this week's lesson. So thank you for your attention and we'll see each other uh, for the next lesson, which would be on the uh, mineral resources. That'll be two weeks from now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, Francine, once again for uh, great content. Uh, I really enjoyed the part about um, what comes into play when deciding whether or not to shut down a site. There's a uh, substantial economic uh, consequences. Oh, yeah. So uh, that was really interesting and uh, insightful uh, to me, at least. Uh, once again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to send them at info at iddpnql.ca. We'll uh, send that information to Francine and we'll get those answers back to you. Uh, once again, thank you very much for those that att attended today. Thank you very much if you're watching this replay. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.